Hey guys, Montel here. Welcome to this edition of Let's Be Blunt. And I am so excited about today's show because I'm coming to you. I wish I was live, but I'm not live, but I'm coming to you. I'm coming to you from Long Beach, California, the convention center in Long Beach, where Mr. Josh Crosby is putting on now one of the biggest cannabis conference in America in the last three or four years. It's the Cannabis Science Conference, and I'm going to bring you a whole bunch of podcasts from here, if I can, because I got a lot of guests walking around out there in the hallway, and I'm going to grab the statue, but bring them in here and say, hey, I'll talk to me for a minute. And today, I'm really excited about talking with a globally respected immunologist credited with many groundbreaking discoveries related to both cancer and ALS. She is a professor in the Division of Oral Biology and Medicine at UCLA School of Dentistry, a member of the Jane and Jerry Weintraub Center for Reconstructive Biotechnology, the Johnson Comprehensive Cancer Center, how many has got to read, Doc? <laughs> cancer Center and the UCA Tumor Immunology Subgroup. She's the queen of the world. She spent 30 plus years studying natural killer cells and is currently the director of the Tumor and Immunology Lab at the Global Top 10 Medical Research University, UCLA. She's joined today by her business partner and a mom on a mission to cure for the find a cure for her daughter's brain tumor and help other patients and children along the way. Dr. Anna. And let me get it correctly. Why don't you correct me? What's your, how do you say your first name? Anahid. Anahid. Thank you. Anahid. Jared, do you like to be called Anahid or Anna? Anna is fine. No, I don't want to be just fine. <laughs> I want what you want, Anahid? Anna is good. I'm okay. All right, cool. Everybody else calls me Anna. No, I'm going to so. call you Anahid. <laughs> of course, Tracy Ryan. What's up, Tracy? Hello, my friend. So good to be back. How are you doing? I mean, last time we talked, you had Sophie in the room with you. Yes. How's Sophie doing, girlfriend? Well, thanks to this woman sitting next to me, she is doing so well. She's never been healthier. Her immune function is... I'll let Dr. Jewett explain it, but it is unlike anything anybody's ever seen. Her tumor is melting away on a natural killer cell therapy and using cannabis and a probiotic that Dr. Jewett invented. It continues to boost the immune function, even though she hasn't had a treatment since December. Whoa, come on now. You know what we ought to do? Let's go back for a minute because a lot of people, I got a lot of people who do listen to this podcast and they will remember the fact that you were on, you were on with Sophie. Yes. Um, um, what was that now? Three years ago? Two well, years if ago? you remember, you actually did an interview with she and I to help us raise money for the treatment that she's oh, on. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yes. That was, that was uh, the last time. That was that's probably two and a half years ago. About, probably about a year and a half, two years, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Um, by the way, I bet you more like two because remember we had COVID in here. I haven't yeah, been I know, here. I yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> COVID is just, I, I can't even keep time with COVID anymore. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. We could talk a little bit about that, that Dr. Jaheed. Uh, sorry, Jaheed, sorry, Dr. Jewett. <laughs> we can talk a little bit about that too, COVID sure. and cannabis in a second. Yes. But let's go back for a minute because, uh, you know, I want people to understand if they can really what you've been through because this yeah. has been a journey beyond journey. I mean, this has yes. been... You know, I, I want to say the, the life of your child. You yes. have literally been battling. So let's take us back to the very beginning. What happened? What was going on? So at eight and a half months old, my daughter Sophie was diagnosed with a low-grade brain tumor called an optic pathway glioma. And was this something that you identify? How did you identify that, first off? Her left eye started shaking, which is called nystagmus. Okay, now I had nystagmus, but I didn't have a tumor. They didn't think that she had a tumor either. They, they said it would be like a needle in a haystack for anything to be wrong with her. They thought it was something that would resolve on its own. But there was one of the doctors that saw who, her who was a new mom who had this weird gut instinct that something more was going on. So they got us into an MRI immediately and we discovered it that way. You know, it's very interesting because, you know, several types of brain cancer can be almost seen when looking in the eye, I guess uh, some people have said that, you know, there's a there's a cloud, there's an image, there's something in the eyeball. And that's why I was wondering and asking that yeah. to give other parents some idea. And then again, let's go to nystagmus. It doesn't always mean that you have cancer or you have a tumor. Um, I had nystagmus related to my MS. It lasted right. for about four or five days. And it stopped. And for those who don't understand what nystagmus is, it's a shaking of the eye that, that if you remember, who's that old comedian, uh, Feldman? What was that guy's name? There was an old comedian, Rodney... Rodney Dangerfield? Not Rodney Dangerfield. I think it was Feldman. I got I to look him up. <laughs> um, he's a comedian that uh, uh, it was his stick. I mean, he could literally make it happen. You know, <laughs> he, his eyes would be perfectly still. And the next thing you know, brrr, just shaking back and forth. Like, you know, um, it, it, so fast, it's like a vibration. So you see that going on. So the doctors did an MRI and yes. discovered what? 
that she had this low-grade brain tumor, and the tumor was wrapping around the optic nerves, hence it being called an optic pathway glioma, wow. and it was restricting vision, and that's why the nystagmus was happening. <clears throat> when, they, we, when we hear glioma, though, glioma is like one of those cancers that, you know, I'm telling you, most of the time you hear that, there ain't much we can do, except for recently except for we're going to talk one. about a lot of breakthroughs, not only this breakthrough, but a breakthrough that just happened in, I think it was Australia in the last year, 20... Uh, February of this last year, mm -hmm. uh, in Australia, doctors realized that uh, a combination of both THC and CBD mm -hmm. seemed to have impact on the radiology, the radiology of radiation effects mm -hmm. when um, treating a specific type of glioma. Was it, it glioblastoma? Was, no, not glioblastoma. It was um, orthotopic murine glioma. Does that sound right? I mean, it's it's possible. That's an animal model that they were using. In the animal before. model. They were yes. using the animal model, yeah. but they've now said that they think it's going to translate to humans very easily. And it literally seems to be blocking the cancer cells' ability to replicate or to... Yes, yeah, to grow. Right? To yes. grow. So yeah. it's, it's really interesting. But go ahead. Tell me a little bit about this. Right. So, well, the good news with Sophie's type of tumor, it's a grade one. Okay. That's a good thing and a bad thing. It's a good thing because it's a 90 to 95% survival rate, but it's a bad thing because it's an 85% recurrence rate. These wow. tumors are slow growing. Chemo only goes after dividing cells and kills dividing cells. These cells don't divide often. So the goal of chemotherapy is to arrest the development of the disease, but the disease will never go away. And because there is so, there's only 3.8% of all government funding that goes to pediatric cancer research, there's been next to no advancements in the last 40 years for children. So when my husband and I discovered this, we we knew we had to do more. And it was shortly after that that I met your dear friend, Ricky Lake, who is the former talk show host and sure. movie star. And her and her production partner, Abby Epstein, had just begun shooting a documentary that's now on Netflix called Weed the People. And that's how we got introduced to cannabis. So at nine months old, Sophie took her first dose of cannabis on camera. And yes, there was THC in it. I, I think sure. THC yeah. is a huge part of the treatment protocol that needs to be used in serious disease. And she has been a medical miracle time and time again since then. The biggest issue with Sophie is that it wasn't completely getting rid of the disease. And the disease continued to build tolerances against the medications that she was on, which were predominantly chemotherapies. And the tumor would stop growing. It would shrink. Then it would grow again. And then it would stop growing. It would shrink. And it would grow again. And it was just this cycle effect. She ended up failing seven therapies. Oh, my goodness. How many surgeries did she have to go to? She's had go three to. major brain surgeries right. and one minor cyst drain where they went through the temple to drain a cyst where they had to pull 40 cc's off of her brain. And wow. it was that fluid that led Dr. Jewett to understand why Sophie has brain cancer. She has a lack of natural killer cells in her brain that are functioning. Well, that's a perfect transition to natural killer cells. Dr. Jewett, <laughs> you're up at the back. You're at the plate. Here comes pitch number one. No, I mean, talk to me a little bit about natural killer cells. And, and what interested you first? I want to back up for a second. Where are you from? And, and tell me a little bit about you. So I was, I'm Armenian. I was okay. born in Iran and I left uh, the country when I was 19 years old because I had just finished my bachelor's degree and I knew that I want to become a cancer researcher at that point. So. I, I, but you know, I've been to Europe, I've been to uh, Armenia three times. Oh, wow. I literally nice. received wow. one of the high, the presidential award of, award of honor for Armenia because uh, I worked with a, uh, pro, a, a, a production company out here that did we did uh the first real documentary about the armenian genocide and it was oh, wow. really the amazing uh, we had it viewed at the un we had it uh, viewed before congress um literally i believe that it was one of the reasons why our congress finally acknowledged the armenian genocide amazing and uh you know uh, you were, thank you so very oh, much yeah. you're quite welcome. and your former president of armenia bestowed upon me there's uh one of their highest awards which was really kind of uh it's, a, it's one of those things I'll remember for the rest of my life. So That's anyway, very just, honorable. Uh, Thank yeah. you. I also met the president of um, Artsakh, uh, oh. Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, Nagorno 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 yeah, yeah, Karabakh. Yeah, it was, uh, I actually had dinner with him, um, the president. Uh, wow. He literally came out of the country to, to meet us because, I mean, you know, the, the uh, documentary was profound in itself. Um, it, it literally, I think we woke people up to the fact that, you know, most people in this world don't understand that, you know, the Armenian genocide happened, what, 30 years, 40 years before 
2018, 2019, 2018. 1915. Yeah. Oh, that's right. 1915. Yeah. 1915. Yeah. 1915. Um, And literally when people, when Hitler was getting ready to institute what he considered his final solution, people asked him, how do you think you're going to get away with this? And he said, nobody cares about Armenia. That's correct. In a speech. Yes. Very, very interesting. Yeah. It's really, really kind of crazy. So anyway. uh, You never cease to surprise me. (laughs) Oh, no, 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 no. no, no. (laughs) But so, okay, so, that's, that's great. So you, you were born in Iran and you... Uh, so I left when I was 19 years old and I mm-hmm. went to Denmark. And, ah. and then from there, I ended up in, in Spain. And and um, I was in the university and, and I met my husband there. And so mm-hmm. we got married and, and, you know, and then I became to U.S. and I continued what my education uh, at UCLA. And, and then... After my uh, doctorate degree, I became a faculty member at UCLA. And since wow. then, I've had great interest in, um, not only since then, since my childhood, I think, I had great interest in curing cancer. And, oh. uh, and one of the things that made me want to do this is because of the fact that my mom suffered from fear of having cancer. Oh. And he, she never had it, but she had fear. And so that translated into me. And I wanted to figure out what this disease is that is causing such an anxiety in my mom. So basically, when when I came here, um, you know, at UCLA, uh, I went to one of the major labs that were uh, studying uh, cancer and immune system. And there I started becoming more and more interested in natural killer cells because I knew that these cells were very important and they were the basis of the diseases that we have. Well, let's talk a little bit about when were natural killer cells first discovered and how come we haven't heard a lot more about them? Um, You know, I think there are politics everywhere, right? Including at the university level. Um, So the the, uh, NK cells were discovered in 1970s. Uh, yeah, around, around well, ten years before the endocannabinoid system was discovered, and or by approximately ten years or better, and colleges and universities are still fighting teaching that right now. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> exactly. Right. Exactly. Um, I mean, we are having the same kind of problems at UCLA because uh, we cannot do research on cannabis, mm-hmm. uh, and and you know, and and the research that I did on cannabis was based basically with synthetics cannabinoids and. And the translation of it is just so exciting, you know. Um, but I'll, I'll get to it. Sure. Uh, let me just give you a little bit about the history of it. No, K please. Cells. So I don't know if you know about T cells. T cells yes. are basically the, the sisters of NK cells. Um, initially, everybody thought that these were T cells, except that they had very different uh, way of killing tumors. Got it. Um, in 1970s, T cells, you know, with T cells, they have to see the cancer for about six days before they can actually say, okay, well, this is cancer and we have to kill. Whereas with the NK cells, they right away, they figure out whether this is cancer or it's not, and then they eliminate it. So because of this spontaneous killing of these tumors, everybody thought, okay, so this should be something very different. And actually a friend a, f- a very dear friend of mine from Karolinska Institute in Sweden. Oh, yes. <laughs> he tried. He pushed for the fact that these were uh, a different types of cells. And, and initially, they called, uh, they called them uh, lymphoid natural killer cells. And then they chopped it up and, and called it natural killer cells. And when I came into the field, uh, we had al- they had already studied these cells for, for a long time. And when I started studying... Uh, you know, a lot of things didn't make sense. You know, things that they were saying wasn't making sense to me because these cells were very unique. And and I found out, actually, initially, I I thought that I was going to study the mechanism of uh, activation of the function. And then every time I was looking at cancer patients or or putting these cells with cancer, they would become inactivated. And so I couldn't understand why a cell becomes inactivated when they have to be fighting cancer. And eventually I figured out that actually this is a mechanism and one mechanism by which that they change their phenotype, they change themselves, become something else to make the cancer cells to become very uh, less aggressive than, you know, than, than initially. And not notice them, basically. Exactly. They kind exactly. of have their own little, little yeah. alien 
you know, what do you call it? Protection shield. <laughs> yeah. So then I, from there on, um, you know, we started studying. I mean, I, I, you know, it was it was very exciting. Every single discovery that I had was pointing out to the fact that these cells were extremely important. But it wasn't until 10 years ago or 10, 15 years ago that we discovered that natural killer cells are also targeting the very seeds of the cancer, <laughs> which is incredibly important because T cells cannot do that. And, um, and because of the fact that these cells are targeting these very aggressive cells, if the NK cells lose their function, unfortunately, then that's what cancer, you know, that's what, where, when we have cancer. And so I started not only studying, uh, you know, humans with cancer, but also I, a lot of studies with animal models, um, including some of the humanized animal models that I will, you know, be talking in, in my talk at, at four o'clock. So, so after we, we discovered that they were very important in targeting these aggressive tumors, then, then we asked more questions, you know, how, how do they change the tumors to become more or less aggressive? And, and so we found the mechanisms and figured out actually that, that, by the way that in case are changing and making them less aggressive, now they become susceptible to everything else. They become susceptible to chemo, to radiation, to uh, checkpoint inhibitors, immun other immunotherapeutics. So I'm gonna touch up on that in my talk today. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's amazing because what we have learned within these last 10 years, it's, 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 it's a world of knowledge that I would have thought that 20 years ago, it would have taken us 100 years to learn, but we've learned within this time span. Mm -hmm. and, and that led me to start asking very important questions. The majority of humans, even those who have not only cancer, but who have autoimmune diseases, people who have infectious diseases, COVID to be one in case, their NK cells are dysfunctional. And that's part of the reason patients suffer from it. And, and so we, we are trying to strengthen, we're trying to strengthen the function of NK cells because we believe not only we're gonna prevent cancer, but also we're gonna prevent a, lot, a slew of other diseases that yeah. um, you know, we are suffering from. One of the things that I tell my students, I'm a professor at UCLA, and one of the things that you know, I, I come in when I you know, tell my students, I tell them, if you can find a disease that is not, does not have the basis on immune function, you don't have to be in my class. I'll give you an A plus and you can leave. Because mm. <laughs> I know that's not gonna happen. They're not gonna find that. And so, so I believe eventually, if we can find combinatorial therapeutics, we're gonna be curing cancer. You know, but let's think about how do, how does cannabinoids or anything in the cannabis plant affect or is it an agonist too? Does it help stimulate that? Explain how the two work together. Four o'clock. Four o'clock. Everybody's gonna lecture. know. <laughs> right, you know well, unfortunately, those, those, those listening right here are gonna be at your four o'clock lecture. I know. I mean, I, I actually I put together a, a talk that really is going to change the face of cannabis and cannabinoids uh, because. You know, initially when Tracy came to me and, and uh, first of all, I, I really refused working on pediatric, uh, you know, cancer because it's just, it's, it just breaks my heart. Like my, right. It's very hard for me. And it's very hard for me for any patients, you know, whether it's adult patient or a pediatric patients. But with pediatrics, it's even worse because, you know, these are kids that they have their whole life ahead of themselves, you know. So when Tracy came and, and I started studying uh, Sophie's tumor and, and I knew that she was on cannabinoids, at first I thought, oh God, this is a horrible combination because everybody says that it's affecting immune system, it's suppressing immune system. So the first thing that I did, I studied the tumor. Um, one of the things that I found from Sophie's tumor was that despite what they are saying that these are slow growing tumors, what I was seeing in the lab was very different. It wasn't slow growing, it was growing very fast in my hands. And so then I started looking at the immune system, uh, 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 Sophie's immune system, and, and I could not put these two together because her immune system was not dysfunctional. You know, I was actually seeing a very good functioning immune system. 
So, so from there, I started actually becoming interested, you know, on cannabis. Why, mm -hmm. what is it that cannabis is doing that is, you know, perhaps keeping these cells without becoming inactivated? And I got to let me stop you there for just a second. But at that point in time, as you learned or known anything about cannabis or cannabinoids? No, you didn't really know. It was anything. not so on her radar you didn't know at all. Anything, all the work that Michelle Nothing. and we had done in the not, 80s. I wasn't actually planning on, right. on learning no about cannabis, cannabis, no pediatrics. <laughs> right. Right. No, 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 no. It wasn't the, the, the pediatrics was because I didn't right want, because of your heart. Yeah, it was, cannabis. It was just too I was just. Again, you know, my misconception that it's a recreational drug and it's not going to be very effective. I mean, it was just my, my misconception. You know, not Only because, again, like you go back to talking about the fact that they were teaching, uh, you know, killer cell information uh, in medical schools. They weren't teaching the information that, that was right there, readily available to them and to the medical community, which is one of the things they're going to tell you. Let's slow down for a second as we continue the story. But, you know, it's 2022. <laughs> Thank you. Come on now. How <laughs> ignorant can we be that right now we have those who are the most educated in our society are complaining about those who don't believe in science, yet they won't believe in science themselves. Thank you. I mean, don't uh, take me wrong. It's not that no, I. And I'm not, wait, I'm, not, saying, I'm not saying you. I mean, but please, I'm not pointing at you, but I'm thinking it's some the of world your at peers. Large. Yeah. <laughs> the, your, the, your peers, the world at large right now. Yeah. I mean, it, it is. It, it just blows my mind. I was at a event a couple of weeks back talking about something else, which is, you know, I'm, I'm involved in, uh, you know, sometimes I, I wonder how the devil do I get involved in so many crazy things? <laughs> I mean, I'm involved in mesenchymal exosomes right now and working very closely with the how they work and why they work. Okay. So, you know, that I do a lot. That is a very interesting yeah, you know, topic weird? to, I mean, to I, actually I, I, talk I'm, about, you know. I'm digging yeah. in deep in a lot of different methods. is that something to do with the MS or is that something to do with the... Uh... It has something to do with my brain not wanting to shut up. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like sometimes I feel like I could just put a plug in it, you know, and stop. But, you know, something something catches my interest and I go, hmm, mm. I wonder if that could. So then I start digging. And then, you know, and I should never do that because once I start digging, you I can't, can't get my head it. up. I can't. You can't like dig that hole. It's stuck in the ground. And my head's Same. like there is. Anyway, well, that's uh, amazing. I mean, that's uh, what the head has to do. I think so. I mean, I think that's yeah. what's... Uh, that's never what stop learning. That's yeah. Never. I mean, you know, why are we here? I, exactly. There's no rest period. I want to make sure I go out on top, knowing everything <laughs> yeah. that I can know. You know what I mean? I might yeah. find out something that says, hmm, I can slow down cellular Mm. Reproduction. Well, I could slow down the age. Well, maybe who knows? Let's see. Mm -hmm. Anyway, let's get back to the truth. So, <laughs> and and I'm on my high horse, and you can jump on high horse. Let, let's let, let's leave the doctor out because you know <laughs> I don't want her getting in trouble with her peers and stuff. <laughs> but you're not sick of the fact that again, 2022, we know for a fact that we've had the research that's available for the entire medical community has been available since. 1985. Yep. We've known about the endocannabinoid system. We know about the fact that there are various maladies that show themselves in humankind because of deficiencies in anandamide. Mm -hmm. We know, yeah. and we also, I, I was blown away, it's about two weeks ago, I, for the last five, six, seven, eight years, I've been on the endocannabinoid system talking about it for the last 12. Mm -hmm. People looked at me like I was crazy five years ago. What are you talking about, endocannabinoid? There ain't no such thing. Yeah, I feel like smacking them. <laughs> and, um, you know, I back then when I was studying, you know, I thought I knew everything. So, you know, you just study to a point that you get enough information. I didn't realize that we have more than 20 endocannabinoids. Mm -hmm. We probably have about 100 of them. We haven't even done... And there's receptors yet to be discovered that there's Dr. Jewett is now yeah. looking into because she knows there is an additional receptor outside of CB1 and CB2 where Correct. activation is occurring. And I bet you there may be even more. Yeah. I don't know. I, yeah. I mean, when yeah. you have a hundred different chemicals that your body produces itself, one receptor isn't present for those hundred. That's I don't correct. buy that. It's got to be correct. more. It's got to be enough of them. Some of them may duplicate their task, but there's got to be enough of them. And so... You we know, are at the infancy of this science. Yes. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I often say that yeah. the you know the the cannabis industry is like uh, you know the Wright brothers pushing that wooden plane down the hill. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> no. I mean, we haven't even got the engines yet. We, we, we got to get engines and jets going. You know? I think we have a jet this afternoon. So. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. And so. the, the the 
the synergy between the world that I was in in cannabis, because you, I you know I had the tincture company formerly Canicus, sure. where we were working with hundreds of patients all over California with our oils, but guiding pa- thousands of patients all over the world with their dosing protocols and helping them find medicines. When you look at how many different diseases and human issues that cannabis works for. And then you also, like Dr. Jewett has said, find me a disease that isn't linked to the natural killer cell system and I'll give you an A because it doesn't exist. Our two worlds colliding and looking at the relationship between cannabinoids, the endocannabinoid system and natural killer cells is beyond, it, your your brain is going to explode so, when so you continue to learn more about what she's discovered. Give us give us the teaspoon, tablespoon version. You don't have to give us a cup, but give us a teaspoon because I, that's a, I want the people at the... Uh, at this conference to go to your lecture this afternoon, there's no way chance of buds. Mm-hmm. But for those that are sitting at home, okay, just break it down for us. How does one endocannabinoids and killer cells, mm. natural killer cells, how do they interact together? Is there something that, that one agonizes the other? What was it? Yeah. So when I saw Sophie and I saw that her immune system was working tremendously, then I asked uh, Tracy. Do we have any other patients that we can look at and, and, and study? And so I ended up actually testing 29 patients, uh, which were, uh, they had cancer and had, can, you know, uh, was were taking cannabis. And interestingly, you know, I could do that study at UCLA. I could not give cannabis to the patients myself because that's something that we cannot do at UCLA. And so when I, I, historically we knew that all of the cancer patients that I've tested, they had uh, very dysfunctional NK cells. And, and I believe that that's part of the reason they have cancer to begin with. Because one of the things that we discovered also in pancreatic cancer, um, you know, th- so what I'm studying in my lab are all the worst cancers, glioblastoma, right. the yeah. lung cancer, the uh, oral cancer, you mm. know, all the resistant cancers and pancreatic cancer. So I went back to the animal model system and asked the question, if I mutate the pancreas and make them susceptible to cancer, am I losing the function of NK cells? And indeed, that's what happened. You know, when I mutated and and gave them high fat calorie diet, which basically pushed, you know, the uh, pre-neoplastic cells and made them cancerous, then I figured, then I looked at NK cells and they were dysfunctional. So... At that point, I said, the reason we have cancer is because natural killer cells are not working very well because NK cells are targeting the seeds of cancer. Mm -hmm. And if we don't remove those, those seeds are going to be seeding, you know, more of the cancer. So so when uh, I got into the cannabis, then I started asking, okay, well, what cannabis is doing or what? Actually, I started studying synthetic cannabinoids uh, because that's allowed at UCLA. Mm -hmm. And I asked the question, you know, are synthetic cannabinoids also targeting cancer stem cells, like NK cells? And when I ran those experiments, and indeed I saw the same pattern, that they were targeting the same things that NK cells were targeting. And that was amazing to me because I had never seen chemo even touching those cells, Wow! you know? And, and to me, I started thinking, okay, well, this could, the reason cannabis is working with chemotherapy is because of the fact that they are targeting two different cells, two different types of tumor cells. Got it. And so I started looking into it and did more experiments and and I proved the fact that that's what it is. She Uh, originally was studying the blood of my patients that were using cannabis oils because as she mentioned, she can't bring cannabis in, but I could give them cannabis and she could then study the response of the cannabis in their blood and their immune function. Then reverse engineering that in a humanized mouse model You've got the hard evidence scientifically that you need. And we've just been accepted to a high impact cancer journal, not a cannabis journal, but a high impact cancer journal, which is a huge win for our industry. Wow. Yeah. So, so after that, uh, one of the things that, (laughs) so that was important, but more important was for me to understand how cannabis was dealing with, uh, in case cells, you Mm -hmm. know, in patients. So what, what, when I was comparing my historical data with the patients that had dysfunctional uh, NK cells and the patients on cannabis, I saw that cannabis, the patients on cannabis, really, they didn't have dysfunctional NK cells. And that, to me, was really amazing. Uh, so cannabis and, was, in a sense, protecting. In a sense. And, now, I have to qualify that yes. by saying 
that my historical data, I've looked at more than two, 300 patients, whereas with cannabis, I've looked at 29 patients. So my sample size is small. Yes. And, and I need more patients to study in order to make actually a larger um, you know, uh, statistics so I can actually say, yes, they are, statistic they are statistically significant at yes. the level of 29 patients right. at this point. However, <laughs> another important factor for me was not just showing what is happening in cancer patients, but to go to a, a very uh, a, a very relevant model to human, which is basically the humanized mouse model. And the way we do that at UCLA is we actually change the immune system completely in these animals, mm -hmm. make them human immune system. Right. And then we can implant tumors and then address all the questions that we want to address. So what, one thing that I did, I actually injected IP, which is intraperitoneally, uh, the, the uh, synthetic cannabinoid, and compared it to an IL-15, which is a cytokine that activates NK cells. This is one of the major cytokines that activates mm -hmm. NKs. And when I looked at the results, it was shocking to me that actually the synthetic cannabinoids were activating NKs the same way as my IL-15. Wow. And, you know, and IL-15... I mean, it, it was just like... To me, I'm still, it's still my, mind, mind blowing, blowing to me, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and I need to do much more. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm enthusiastic about continuing these kinds of studies because I'm seeing some relevancy. <laughs> but, you know, I, and, I, and I agree with you, the studies need to be done over time. But you know what? Did we not approve vaccines? with statistically less numbers. Let's get back to the drawing board. I'm not talking about after we started dispensing them around the world. I think the original, you know, vaccines for COVID, I think they were like small studies, 140 yeah. people, 150 yeah. people maximum. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. I, I'm thinking statistically, you know, uh, credible yeah. numbers as yeah. long as, you know, two out of three yeah. hit a home run. I, I, I don't mind that. You right. know what I mean? yeah. And right. why should we not, why should we make now patients wait 30, 40 years, you know, which is going to be why? Oh, we'll, we'll make them wait that long because I'm going to talk about it this this afternoon. Yeah. It's the fact that this industry has not realized that the federal government owns you. Mm -hmm. and they don't own you because they made this illegal. They own you because they patented CBD in 2002. Mm -hmm. They've extended that patent now at least once, I can't find any data at all. You can't look it up. See if you can find data on the fact that U.S. patent number 6603507 has been extended at least one time. What's going on right now? Yeah, You can't find it. You Look it up. You can't find anything on the U.S. patent. And why? Mm. This is the one that I, I don't fear, but I want us to pay close attention to. If tomorrow the federal government says we are exercising the rights under our patent, anybody in the entire country that's doing anything related to CBD and even around the world need to stop that day. They could arrest you for a patent violation. Patent infringement. Patent infringement. As, as every dispensary around the country that's got any CBD whatsoever on their shelves in any Formulation whatsoever on the shelves. If it's part of a vape cart, if it's in an ounce that you're going to sell, if it's down to 0.01%, they claim they own that. Mm -hmm. Is this, you're, you're saying U.S. government? Has oh, my it? goodness, my dear. Did you not? I just hoped you didn't know that. But back in 2000, first off, let's back up. The only reason why Raphael Mishulam was able to study cannabis the way he did in the early 80s was out of our taxpayer dollars. The U.S. government funded a lot of Raphael's research in the 80s and the 90s, utilized his research in the 90s after he published all the documents and publications from other universities around the world about endocannabinoid system. But hmm. after U.S. dollars were used to investigate that, the U.S. government issued themselves a patent in 2002, we filed for that patent in 1998. The patent is again, 6603507. Sometimes they say B, it's not B, it's 6603507. That is the patent number. And if you go back and look at the here, I'll look it up on my phone real well, quick. Well, patents are good for 20 years, so maybe that's why 17. you can't find it anymore. 17 years. Oh, I thought it was 20. I think it's 17. You would know, you've got and about 17 60 of them. <laughs> I, have, I, I got about three of them myself, but I was like, you know. Um, 
Yeah, uh, so they extended it once. I don't know if they extended it a second time. They probably have, or they're just sitting back there acting like, I don't care what you say, yeah. it's ours. But if we don't pay attention and they decide in the next year and a half, while we're waiting for elections to, to exercise their rights under the U.S. patent, they can shut down every dispensary in every state across the country. It's terrifying. That's amazing. Wow. Well, and, yep. you know, Dr. Jude a minute ago was talking about IL-15, and Sophie uh, received IL-2 with her therapy, which is... They're basically There's, the same yeah, thing. Similar, but different. A little bit different. Yeah. But yeah. they they use this in immunotherapy when they're treating patients. And IL-2, natural killer cells, when Sophie received her dad, she got her dad's natural killer cells that were activated. They weren't supercharged like the ones that Dr. Judas created and that, that our company together now have the patent for. We have to get FDA approval for those. Sophie's were just activated with IL-2, which is not, if you don't have to have FDA for that because you're not changing the cell enough. Got it. Um, the natural killer cell infusion that she got of her father's cells that were activated, she just had a high fever for a few hours that she used Tylenol for. But when they used IL-2 to originally activate those cells, those cells became drug dependent on IL-2. So she had to get five days of IL-2 shots and she's never been sicker than from those IL-2 shots. She, it was only, the half-life is very short. So she was only sick for seven days, but it was, we didn't leave the bed for a week. Wow. What, and the reason I want to bring that up is because, as she mentioned a minute ago, cannabinoids are activating natural killer cells as well as IL-15 and IL-2. So she should be giving cannabinoids toxic. instead of the other well, ones were less And toxic. she's getting them, and her function continues to skyrocket. Dr. Jewett yeah. just got so, more so, blood work done. Uh, you know, I, so, uh, I think we have to be careful also. We have to study a, this more. Yeah, sure. and, we and, definitely have and, to study and, it more. And they... They work through different mechanisms, yes. and 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 I believe part of the reason I'm I'm working with this is because eventually I want to have combination therapies where I can exactly. actually use lower levels of these cytokines mm -hmm. with different you know compounds in order to be able to give a very uh, important or I would say key levels of these uh, activators mm -hmm. that would cause the NK cells will remain active for longer periods of time. Right, without making know, the patient so. extraordinarily sick. sick. Mm -hmm. Right. And fixing what's wrong with their body, which allowed them to have cancer in the first place, which is a broken natural killer cell system. So we're not targeting the body with disease, or targeting the tumor with heavy toxicity like chemos and radiations, and some immunotherapies are very toxic as well and can be dangerous and cause cytokine storms. Natural killer cells, there's, there's never been a case in the history of the world of anyone dying from these cells. You don't have the same kind of rejection with these cells. So There is there's absolutely recent published information supporting the fact that Cannabinoids, again, CBDA, CBGA, mm -hmm. the acid form, pre-deep carboxylation, mm -hmm. literally seem to inhibit the cytokine storm and is showing evidence in being a way to not only slow down COVID mm -hmm. because the CB, CBDA and CBDG or CBGA both attached to the spike protein, mm -hmm. which inhibits its ability to enter the cells, yeah. which then doesn't spark the immune system in the same. I have human experience yeah. with that. We had a little girl named Zalea who had uh, impal leukemia, which is a combination of ALL and AML. It's very rare. There's not really many treatments for it, if any. She had leukemia for six years. She had to have a bone marrow transplant. She had a 0% chance of surviving even the implantation process or 0.2% chance of surviving the impl implantation process, but 0% chance of surviving the bone marrow process. Wow. Although it was the only option. So they went for it anyway. And we had to lie to the doctors. The mom did because they said, if you use cannabis during this treatment, we're going to kick your daughter out of the program. She gave her CBD anyway. We followed um, a graft versus host study out of Israel showing that CBD was reversing the graft versus host. Zalea used the CBD the whole time that she was on uh, going through the bone marrow transplant. And they started calling her the miracle child because she wasn't getting graft versus host. She had a very, very, very minute case of it. She wasn't having the severe pain. They had her on like a baby drip of morphine when normally these kids are like hitting the button all day. She was up and she was playing and she was doing crafts. And that is not what you do when you go through a bone marrow transplant. 
And she ended up getting out of the hospital 35 or 40 days early. And every time they went to study her, she was six to eight months ahead of the healing process. And they deemed her the miracle child that they had never, they'd never seen anything like it in the history of the hospital. This little girl was not supposed to live. And she's just as healthy as her sisters today. And I guess that's what they're also saying about selfie. I mean, this was something that um, literally is a breakthrough I, I know some other people who are going through as a family, going through a, a family member who has uh, glioma that, um, you know, they've given them just a very short period of time to live. And I, I, I keep, you know, typing out a little text and saying, you should ask the doctor about this. And of course, I know what they're going to get back from the yeah. doctor. So Sophie's the first patient in the history of the world with this type of disease to get a natural killer cell therapy like this. And we're seeing profound responses. But, you know, again... I go back to what we were talking about and yeah, guys, we do get to see each other before we start the podcast and we were chatting a little bit before the podcast. And what I'm so disappointed in is the fact that this information is there. And unfortunately the way we work as a nation is you got to get it published here and you got to yeah. get it published there. Such a long there. process. It'll be three years before anybody else will have an opportunity to even do, do this. And Dr. Eda, I had to look it up for you because I, I knew you were surprised. But yes, in fact, the U.S. government owns a patent. It's 66, this is 6630. I always thought it was 6603. That's 30. 6630507. Why the feds hold a patent on cannabis? And they do. Cannabinoids. They, the, in the, the patent, the U.S. government says cannabinoids as antioxidants and neuroprotectants. Uh, this was issued back in October of 2003. Mm -hmm. Sorry, not 2003. It was 17 years. would have been 2020. Yep. They extended it once. So I guess it's, the extension must still be going on. They didn't have to extend it twice. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so I'm just, you know, sometimes I feel just so frustrated in the fact that and I don't believe that I'm the only one, but but I believe there's not enough voices out there every day yeah. trumpeting this yeah. kind of information. I don't have to wait for this to get published in some damn yeah. cancer magazine. I could care less whether or not a cancer magazine publishes this or not. <laughs> I care about whether or not this information gets to the people. Yes. People are suffering. I mean, I, I literally this morning and, and, and you know, she's a friend of mine. Selma Blair was on oh, yeah. uh, the the view this morning right mm -hmm. before I was walking out of my my bedroom and or my hotel room. So I was I was catching it and she was talking about, you know, the horror she's gone through mm -hmm. since being diagnosed with MS and, um, and talking about, you know, uh, a very difficult life that has led her to an even more difficult life right now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I met with Selma and I've sat down and talked to Selma at her, at her own home. Um, I tried to convince her to girlfriend. I'm telling you, it's like, if you've never done it, she's, you know, may have imbibed a little bit in the past recreationally, but it's time to, change horses in the middle stream. The day I got diagnosed with MS, before that I had probably been recreationally smoking maybe once a week or once every couple of weeks. Sometimes I smoked three or four days a week, but then most of the time it was maybe once, a very just aperiodically. It wasn't something that was like a part component right. of my life. The day I got diagnosed with MS, every day mm -hmm. since then, I've ensured that I make sure that I have a certain amount of cannabinoids in my body. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying to people out there that that's what's kept my MS at bay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I will credit cannabis as much as I credit any other treatments I'm involved in. I'm, in, I'm involved in treatments that nobody on this planet is involved in. Right. I'm involved in neuromodulation that seems to have worked for me mm -hmm. extremely well. I've been doing the same neuromodulation for the last 10 years through with two cranial nerves, my tongue into the pons area of my brain, putting wow. my brain in a plastic state, utilizing the plastic state and that device and, and, uh, uh, physical therapy that is, is tied together. I'm sorry, guys, I just keep banging this table. Um, <laughs> a combination of physical therapy and a something called a PONS device, a portable neuromodulation device mm. uh, that I've been using that literally along with cannabis, I think is the reason why I am thriving Yeah. Mm. at this age, late age as an African-American with the disease that people claim that I'm supposed to be in the worst category of all. Yeah. Excuse me. <laughs> so I must be doing something right. You look so healthy well, every time I see you. It's well, unbelievable. I thank you. I really do. I thank you for that. So, I mean, I, I, I look to her and I think, you know, Sama, I, I really wish I could help you navigate the cannabis space to help kind of not necessarily relieve you of all your symptoms, 
but literally put those symptoms into a perspective that are manageable. Right. That's what cannabis does for me. Now, what I think it probably is doing at the cellular level is the fact that we know that, you know, cannabinoids do have an effect on our cellular homeostasis. So mm -hmm. if it's keeping my nervous system in check, not fighting with it itself, I think that's part of what's going on. It, it, it immediately reduced eight or nine of my symptoms that I had mm -hmm. three days in, mm -hmm. gone, mm -hmm. never got them back. Mm -hmm. Now, at the time, when I first started using them, that was the only thing that I had changed in my life yep. mm -hmm. about MS. I mean, I, I've, I've seen thousands of patients all over the world get better. There's Nobody could ever tell me that this plant isn't doing something miraculous in the human body. And after what Dr. Jewett has discovered, it makes more sense to me now from a scientific level, which is really was my goal. I, I kept seeing all these patients get better and better and better with all of these different types of diseases, but it wasn't enough for me to just see them get better. I wanted to know why they were getting better so that we could try and come up with a medicine that could be accessible to all, covered by insurance, and administered to you in your hospital by your doctor so that people stop suffering from taking these toxic medications that cause them more problems. So now, Doctor, will this end up being a protocol or will it be a single medication or a double medication? Well, I mean, you're going to have to kind of combine TH or combine cannabinoids with what to help them stimulate so, the killer cells yeah so one of the things one of the projects in the lab right now is to uh, make these synthetic cannabinoids to work even better and and the way we are going to do this is to change the molecules to change the synthetic molecules and create something that has a higher affinity for binding to the cells. And we would like actually then that would become a medication, basically. Okay. Um, and and that's that's you know one of the projects that is running in the lab. So here, here I come with the with the cannabis question. So why do I need to do this with a synthetic cannabinoid? Why can't I do this with a natural cannabinoid? You're not allowed to study it right now here as of yet. But then again, you could be allowed to study because you can now petition the DEA and the DEA is open to mm -hmm. particular investigatorial studies. There's a study right. going on out here in California right now right. with the cannabinoids and their right. effect on PTSD. Right. Yeah. And it's going to take a fed long is, time is a, because yeah. all the individual molecules in the plant, you have to study each of them individually that, and then it's that a combination. Is of, that is one of the major limitations because you know, the, the preparation of each plant may be different and, mm -hmm. and the variability that we may end up seeing that could cause a lot of issues. You okay, know, but I mean, I, I just go back to the nightmare that surrounded Marinol back in the early 90s and still exists today. That's a synthetic THC, Delta 9, right? It's because but the, but it, it wasn't was developed the, right. properly. Correct. The way that she's talking about developing this molecule is so that it truly acts in the body as... A, a cannabis plant, like a whole plant effect sure. would, not a single molecule THC. Because yeah. when you take single or molecule like THC- a, Or like a cytokine. Sure. Exactly. That we are, that you know, I mean, it. It, that becomes part of our own system, right. you know, and it's not a drug or it's not something. Right. This IL-15 is is what we ourselves induce or produce, you know, so it's we natural. want to have something like that too. Got it. Mm -hmm. And when, you, when it comes to replicating a medicine from whole plants- Right. And- and then giving that to the world as a medication, you're talking about having to grow fields and fields and fields and fields and making every plant the same across the board in, in order right. to have a medicine that the FDA will accept as one that is the exact same in every bottle for every patient. Right. The process is going, would take 20 times longer. But it's still going to take 20, 20 years times now. more money. I don't think so. Right. I think I don't, no. we are very I, I, we're, close. We're, really? We are yeah. moving a lot faster than you could ever imagine. Cool. And we are going. We're going to be submitting our for our supercharged natural killer cell therapeutic in the next couple of weeks. We're going to be submitting our application for our pre IND meeting with the FDA, which gets us on their calendar. And then as soon as they uh, receive that application, within I think it's sixty days, then they will grant us uh, the right to start human trials. And we're also working on some other things in other countries that could help us get into patients even faster sure. than that. And then with the molecule, developing the molecule, we think that we can get that through Very quickly fast, as well. Yeah. Actually, I, I, you know, the, the funny thing is that, you know, I went to China in order to do the trials on my supercharged NK cells. And we injected our first patient after 14 days of receiving supercharged NKs. He was up and running and, you know, he was healthy. Wow. Couldn't find cancer and, in the body. Wow. But I had to stop it because of COVID. So I couldn't continue with that. Right. Wow. And uh, the, 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 
I mean, yesterday I was uh, with the uh, congressman. I was mm -hmm. telling the same thing. Why does it take so long for mm -hmm. us to do these groundbreaking work and getting, you know, the medications into mm -hmm. the patients? And it's to me, it's mind boggling. Something yeah. that you know and it's going to be working, you know, you're not allowed to actually give to the patients. Well, I so, do. What's, what's so crazy about it is that they can make not just exceptions, but they can change that. At the, you know, that's a sign a piece of paper. That's this what is, we did for why, COVID, right? This is why we're bringing in members of Congress to support us. So if we have any challenges with the FDA, we can come in with letters signed from multiple members of Congress mm -hmm. that that is telling them these therapies need to be expedited. They're safe. They're effective. We've got more safety data times five than most companies would ever hope to have. We've got over 30 years of research, over 350 humanized mouse models using these cells. There's a human mm -hmm. patient that's been treated as well. And so we are, we're guns blazing right now. And wow. I'm really excited about how fast we're moving and very optimistic about being in patients this year. Are we, are we uh, now, I know you also work with ALS, yeah. correct? Mm -hmm. Is correct. there implications with the same research with ALS? So autoimmune diseases are, are right. very different from cancer. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I started actually looking into ALS about four or five years ago. I mean, for me, challenge is the most important thing. And, and, and I wanted to, to understand, uh, because if we understand how autoimmunity works, we understand how cancer works. And if you understand how cancer works, we understand autoimmunity. And because of, you know, I'm an immunologist, my expertise is in immunology. I wanted to know what is going on. Why is it that the patients really are targeting their own service, uh, CNS, you know, their own ner nervous system? And what we found that one of the population of T cells called CD8 positive T cells became very aggressive. And, and that now targets every single, you know, uh, muscle cells and nervous system. And, and unfortunately, that's why they progress. So one of the things that we suggested and we treated one of the patients uh, uh, was with what we call uh, NAC, N-acetylcysteine, which is a very natural product everybody can take. Get it on Amazon. <laughs> you know? Yeah, unfortunately, they don't understand that NAC has to be buffered in a mm -hmm. certain way mm -hmm. before it can be effective. And so now there are pharmaceutical companies, they are giving it as a powder, which basically doesn't work properly. Right. Um, so we were treating the patient with that. And in addition to that, we started looking into actually blocking the immune function by giving anti-TNF, anti-IL-6, you know, some of these cytokines to inhibit some of the cytokines, but we, could, we weren't getting anywhere uh, with that. And finally, we decided, okay, well, we're going to produce T regulatory cells to block actually the function of these aggressive CD8 positive T cells. And we, you know, based on the studies that we did in the lab, we were successful to do that. But unfortunately, oh. the patient, you know, did not survive through, oh. uh, not, not because of the treatment, but because of progression, progression. of the disease. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But he survived actually five years, wow. you know, with ALS. Um, so, so more and more we're learning how we could actually tame the, uh, the function of the immune cells and not wow. allow... If, if we can combine now, if our understanding of autoimmune diseases with cancer, we can actually find treatments for both of them, mm -hmm. wow. you know, and that's, that's why I'm doing both at the same time. That's great. She's a busy lady. <laughs> You're a busy lady. And how is Sophie doing today? Oh, she's doing so well. We continue to see the tumor melt away on her natural killer cell therapy. She's never been healthier. We've seen her vision return. Her left-hand side disability continues to get better and better. She's running around like a crazy hyena. She is she is something. I can't wow. wait for you to see her tomorrow. She's gotten so big and she's so energetic and she's so happy, Montel. That's right. Which I think, but you know, you've done a lot of work with PTSD and war vets, and you've sure. seen how profound it can be for trauma. And I I believe that because Sophie has been on cannabis her whole life, it's also helped with that trauma response. And right. you just won't meet a child that's happier than this little girl. Absolutely. Well, I, I got to tell you, I, can't, I could go on for an on and on and on and on and on, but I, I just want to thank the two of you for being here. And then I'm, I'm, I know, Dr. Jude, I know the work that you're doing is going to get an opportunity to get blasted out there. Mm -hmm. And we just have to make sure that we continue to maybe come, maybe come back on the show again uh, so we can just keep talking about it so it keeps it in people's, you know, forethought. And, you know, knock on wood that we get to, to share this and, and make sure more and more people understand that there is viability in mm -hmm. 
this research, but there's also viability in this plant. Yes. And it's given blessings to so many. Yes. And yes. we will make sure that you are at the top of the list as soon as we mm. start making more announcements. You've, you've been so wonderful in giving us a platform to help us get these messages out. So thank well, you for that. I want to thank the two of you for being a part of the show today. And thank you guys for listening. You know, you can always find out more and more information if you want, just by going up on our website and hit that little subscribe button. Leave us a, uh, you know, hey, you want to critique us? Leave us a little critique. I, I will listen to them. I always do. <laughs> and I want to thank you for being a part of it. Let's be blunt with Montel. Thanks for joining me on Let's Be Blunt with Montel. Please make sure you're subscribed and hit the bell to be notified when new episodes post each week. We'd love to hear your feedback also, so please send us your comments.